Uh, this panel is convened to discuss a book that I'm sure all of you have heard of. It's The Death of the West, published just this year in January. It's hot off the presses. It's written by Patrick Buchanan. And uh, the four of us will, uh, I suspect, take uh, different points of view on this. I should describe, uh, uh, give you some introduction as to the various panelists. Uh, you're familiar with myself already. Uh, sitting next to me is uh, James Russell. He was actually a delegate for Patrick Buchanan in uh, the 1996 New York presidential primary. He's also been a candidate in the Republican primary for Congress. He has a doctorate in historical theology from Fordham University, and he has taught at uh, St. Peter's College. In this uh, group, he's probably best known for his excellent monograph, The Germanization of Early Medieval Christianity, which was published by Oxford University Press. And he is soon to be the executive director of what organization? Uh, the Institute for Western Civilization. Uh, he will be the director of the Institute for Western Civilization. And uh, I cannot but imagine that that will be an institute that will promote ideas extremely welcome to the people in this room. Uh, seated next to uh, Mr. Russell is Sam Dixon. Sam Dixon has spoken at every American Renaissance conference, and he will be giving the closing remarks uh, after this panel. He's a 1969 graduate of the University of Georgia, where he studied history and political science. In 1972, he got his law degree from the same institution, and he's had quite uh, a career as a legal scholar. He is the author of two volumes of the Encyclopedia of Georgia Law. He's also contributed one of the volumes to Kunin's Commentaries on Federal Civil Procedure. He's also the author of uh, a well-read and well-circulated pamphlet called Shattering the Icon of Abraham Lincoln, Good Southerner That Brother Dixon Is. <laughs> Until his uh, retirement from the law just last year, he specialized in real estate litigation, but he has also been active in defending racial activists in criminal and uh, civil procedures. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Council of Conservative Citizens and has been very, very active in all of our causes for a great many years. Seated next to Mr. Dixon is Sam Francis, whom I've already introduced to you. He has also uh, participated in every single American uh, Renaissance conference. So this is our panel. Uh, what we propose to do is each of us speak for a few minutes, and uh, then we will open the floor uh, to questions. <clears throat> Uh, I suppose we might as well go in the order in which we're seated here. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to just describe a little bit about the book. You've already heard enough from me, so I'll try to keep my remarks pretty brief. Uh, Patrick Buchanan, in writing this book, The Death of the West, is talking about, in his view, two different kinds of death. One is the kind that we have discussed at some length today, and that is the physical disappearance of Western man. And that disappearance is coming through sub-replacement fertility, the fact that whites are not having enough children to reproduce themselves. And that disappearance is being urged along through immigration, the floods of non-whites, non-Europeans who are coming into the homeland of Western man. At the same time, and uh, there is certainly a connection between these two things, but I think they could be treated separately. He's talking about a kind of spiritual death of the West. As you know, uh, Patrick Buchanan is a Catholic, and I think much of what this book is about reflects his Catholic beliefs and his indignation at a society that accepts abortion and euthanasia, sexual license, feminism, homosexuality, destruction of traditional sex roles, all of this is deeply, deeply disturbing to Mr. Buchanan. And he attributes this kind of decline primarily to the decline of religion. He also makes a case, I think quite an interesting one, and one that I've been reflecting on since I read this book, that it is only in societies that have a firm religious grounding that you find the desire to have enough children to, replace, to reproduce yourselves. I think so, for, in his view, 
this unwillingness to reproduce ourselves as well as the cultural degradation that we see around us, both of these factors are intimately linked to the decline of Christianity. I think uh, it's, uh, in a way, the first of his theses, the idea about the population decline of the men and women who founded Western civilization that's of particular interest to us. And I'll read to you what was, to me, an especially arresting passage about the failure of our people to reproduce themselves. He's uh, writing here about the Spanish birth rate. He says, if 100 Spanish young people marry today, they can expect to have 58 children, 33 grandchildren, and 19 great-grandchildren. That means they're going from 100 to 19 in just three generations. That is an astonishing decline. I'm not convinced that those sub-replacement rates will continue, but if they do, we face oblivion in very, very short order. Of course, the aspect of this book that the people in this room would hold against Buchanan is his unwillingness to equate the culture of the West with the race of the people who founded this culture and are carrying it forward. He does not make an explicitly racial argument. It's as if he comes up to the edge of race, tiptoes around it, but never specifically says, look, if these people are gone, then the culture goes with them. And I understand that on television, although I've not seen his performances myself, he deliberately backpedals on the subject of race and says, no, 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 I'm talking only about culture. This, of course, leaves him in the awkward position of having to dis defend his opposition to Mexican immigration, for example. Well, Mexicans uh, are at least some form of Catholic. They are certainly more church-going, probably, than the non-Mexicans living in this country. Why should he be opposed to them if by bringing into America their Catholicism, their belief in God, surely they should be reinvigorating all the culture of the West that he admires, and they should be. They also have a high birth rate, too. So what is the problem here? Well, that puts Mr. Buchanan in a terrible dilemma. How do you reconcile these two problems? Uh, and it has been his unwillingness to speak in a straightforward way about race, his appointment of Isola Foster, a black woman, as his running mate. This has... Uh, <laughs> In fact, well, quite enraged some people who had been prepared to support him. I think, in a way, it's a little bit unfair. Well, it's not just a little bit unfair. It is unfair to hold against Patrick Buchanan uh, the failure to do things he never promised he would do. He has never said that he is a spokesman for the white race. Uh, I think, I tend to be generally grateful and pleased for the things that people are willing to say, and I prefer not to reproach them for the things that they are unwilling or unable to say. Patrick Buchanan is the most prominent person in the United States, I believe, who is saying straightforwardly, we must deport these illegals, and we must cut back on immigration to something around 200,000 200, people a year, and that our immigration policy should be strictly in our interests, not in anyone else's. I think to have said those three things, get rid of the illegals, cut back on legal immigration, and do it all in our interests, to have a prominent voice saying that is a very important thing. And in that sense, uh, perhaps some in this room will consider me over generous, but I think he's doing the country a great service by saying these things repeatedly and in a prominent fashion. And likewise, on this policy of being happy to hear people who are willing to say things that suit us and um, not being too reproachful when they don't, I think even people like uh, David Horowitz are doing and saying useful things. I think even Rush Limbaugh often says useful things. So I think that it's somewhat mean-spirited to inquire into his motives. Is Patrick Buchanan really trying to fool us? Does he really know about race? He's afraid to talk about race. I don't think these discussions are particularly helpful. I've met Mr. Buchanan on two different occasions, and I am disinclined to impute to him any kind of false consciousness here. Perhaps it is his universalist Catholic view of the world. Perhaps it's simply that he has not thought deeply about race. I think that he is willing to go as far as he feels inclined to go, and in my view, God bless him. 
I would like to read a few passages from his book that do certainly approach the racial question, if not, in fact, explicitly crossing into it. Here, uh, let's see. <clears throat> he writes quite clearly on page 125, history and experience teach us that different races are far more difficult to assimilate. The 60 million Americans who claim German ancestry are fully assimilated while millions from Africa and Asia are still not full participants in American society. It's very important to say these things, even if you're not prepared to say what we feel is a crucial thing, that our civilization depends on us. On page 146, he quotes John Stuart Mill as having warned that free institutions are next to impossible in a country made up of different nationalities, among a people without fellow feeling especially if they read and speak different languages, the united public opinion necessary to the working of representative government cannot exist. This is clearly a blow against the prevailing foolishness about the strength of diversity. And then finally, uh, one more passage here. He writes about President Clinton's famous speech at Portland State Commencement in which he talked about uh, uh, a future non-white America. And he says that when Mr. Clinton said that in 50 years there would be no majority le race left in America, students broke out into spontaneous applause. Now, Portland State is an overwhelmingly white institution. He goes on to say, surely it is a rarity in history that a people would cheer the news that they and their children would soon be dispossessed of their inheritance. I think uh, uh, these are powerful and important sentiments for a prominent American to be expressing. I'm delighted that he's on television to the extent that he is. I wish, of course, that he were a stouter spokesman for our point of view. But once again, I'm pleased that he's saying the things that he's saying. I support him in what he does. And I'm, now I'm very curious to hear what our other panelists have to say about Patrick Buchanan. And oh, by the way, I think if you can hold your questions to the end, then we can have a bit of a discussion here. So please welcome uh, James Russell. Thank you, Jared. Pat Buchanan's latest book, The Death of the West, is a major contribution toward the restoration of our civilization. As a current bestseller, Buchanan's book places the issue of our impending demise squarely in the public eye and opens it up to a vigorous national debate, a debate in which we should all participate. Buchanan vividly portrays the two main problems confronting the West today, our demographic dilemma and the cultural war that is being waged against us. Using the latest U.S. Census and United Nations population surveys, Buchanan illustrates the disastrous effects of continued high non-European immigration into Western nations, combined with low birth rates within these nations. For example, he notes that while China's population is swelling, Russia's birth rate is only 1.17 children per woman, with an average of 2.5 to 4 abortions each. If these rates continue, within 15 years, the Russian population will decline by 22 million, more than the total of Russian casualties in the Second World War. But it is Buchanan's analysis of the cultural war that has impressed me the most. The decline of the West has not occurred merely due to the apathy and selfishness of our own people. However, before the publication of The Death of the West, I don't believe that many Americans were aware of the existence of a group of Marxist revolutionaries and their disciples who have deliberately sought to subvert Western civilization. As Buchanan tells it, following the First World War, some Marxists were disappointed that communist revolutions hadn't occurred throughout Europe. <clears throat> They concluded that the primary reason European workers were loyal to their respective nations during the war and didn't rebel was due to their patriotism, their religious devotion, and their strong family structure. 
Therefore, Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, Antonio Gramsci, and Herbert Marcuse, a group of Marxists who became known as the Frankfurt School, initiated a critique of Western morality, tradition, religion, and culture, and condemned Western societies as, quote, history's greatest repositories of racism, sexism, nativism, xenophobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and fascism, end of quote. As a result of this constant critique, our people have become afflicted with a deep-seated guilt syndrome. The most normal and healthy expressions of national and ethnic cohesion, which are, in reality, a form of collective self-esteem, have been described as aberrations, while the most deviant and destructive sexual and social behaviors have been legitimized and advocated by a degenerate media and academia that have internalized the destructive principles of the Frankfurt School. How does Buchanan propose to counter this incessant assault on our civilization? Culturally, Buchanan suggests a form of cultural secession to remove ourselves from the decadent dominant culture which surrounds us and perhaps create an alternative culture of our own with parallel educational and media institutions. Politically, Buchanan notes that, quote, if there is a will, there is no shortage of constitutional ways by which a people can recapture their right to rule themselves, end of quote. Some of his recommendations include the establishment of term limits for federal judges and support for public officials who resist judicial tyranny. But Buchanan ultimately believes that, quote, politics cannot bail the West out of its crisis, for it is not a crisis of material things, but a crisis of the soul, end of quote. He implies that only a Christian revival will have the power to save the West. But it is not the perpetually groveling form of contemporary Christianity that will accomplish this. Buchanan states, quote, if the West expects a long life, it had better recapture the fighting faith of its youth, end of quote. He briefly considers racial solidarity as a source of Western cohesion, but dismisses it because of the many fratricidal European conflicts of the past. However, his dismissal may be too hasty. White racial solidarity is a work in progress, and if properly cultivated, should have the potential to help restore our civilization. Racial solidarity or Christian revival alone may not be sufficient to reverse our decline. But racial solidarity, supported by a fighting faith, just might be the formula to ex extricate the West from its impending doom. I'm afraid this is going to be the good cop, bad cop act, with me being the bad cop and the three good cops, uh, two of whom you have heard. What are we to make of Pat Buchanan? Um, as a person, he is a difficult person not to like. Uh, he is, is uh, charming, uh, and one wants to, to believe in him. Uh, and I myself have been a supporter of his. But I must say, uh, and this, uh, I will get to his book in a minute, but I must say that of all the people living in America today, I can hardly imagine anyone who has dealt a d more devastating blow uh, to our race and its struggle for survival than Patrick Buchanan. Uh, Jared alluded to his choice of Mrs. Foster, who may be a very nice person, uh, uh, but who was a catastrophic choice 
as vice president or nominee of the Reform Party. Uh, one really wonders how he could have made such an egregiously bad choice. Uh, a choice could not have been calculated to be more devastating to the chances of the Reform Party. And he says that he had never considered who his vice presidential nominee would be uh, and that he made the decision on the spur of the moment. If this is true, uh, this is a very serious disqualification uh, of his ability to be the leader uh, of our country. Uh, surely, uh, just common sense would cause you to consider who your running mate was going to be uh, long in advance of the convention. I think what is wrong with, with Pat Buchanan uh, is exactly what Mr. Taylor alluded to a few minutes ago, and, and that is there is no sense of race. He has no feeling of race. Uh, he is not a sociopath, uh, a, a type of personality with whom, of whom we have many, many millions in our society, who, a, a sociopath being someone who does not connect, uh, who does, does not connect at all. He does connect. He connects with his church. Uh, he connects with his religion. Uh, he connects somewhat with his heritage, but he does not connect with race. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, you either have a feeling of race or you don't have a feeling of race. Uh, and I'm not sure that somebody who does not have a feeling of race uh, can ever really acquire one. Uh, he says that he grew up in Washington, D.C. I've been told by friends of his, people who know him, I, I don't know him, I've met him. As I say, I'm inclined to like him. I supported him. I would not do so again. Uh, I'm sorry to have to say the things that I'm saying here and to be the uh, bearer of bad news and the voice of negativity. Uh, but he says that he grew up in Washington, D.C., and he's told people who do have racial feelings that he never thought about race. I mean, to me, this is just, it's like growing up in Rome and never thinking about the Pope. How could you grow up in Washington, D.C., and never think about race? Uh, I mean, what does this tell us uh, about the lack of any racial feeling? And reading his book, which uh, I, I had the same feeling that there was no feeling, there was no intensity, there, there was no burning. He, he says it and he tries to say it, but it isn't really there. There's not the sense of commitment uh, that we need. Uh, we are facing difficult times, and, and his book is useful, I think, with the mass audience. Uh, the Ordinary American Who Has Not Thought About This. It's a useful compilation of statistics, uh, but it is not of use uh, to the people in this room. And we're speaking to each other uh, here in this room and not to the ordinary uh, person in, out in the mall in New Jersey or at the church in Boston. Uh, we're speaking among ourselves. We are, we are far in advance of them. The, we have to be led by people who are strongly committed. Uh, the, I, I quoted once before this, this Bible verse, and I don't mean to be a Bible thumper, because I certainly am the least person on the earth entitled to be one. Uh, but you know, if the note of the trumpet be not certain, who will prepare himself for the battle? How can we be led by people who do not believe in race? Someone who could pick uh, a black high school teacher as his running mate. <coughs> we want to believe that someone like Pat Buchanan will come to us from the establishment and lead us into the promised land. But th this, could, this would be nice if it happens, but to a certain extent, this is a deception. If something is to be done, it has to be done by us in this room, by people like us. We cannot wait for a deus ex machina uh, to come and to remedy our situation. I note in his book uh, that his errors have not stopped. The, the last person he quotes in his book, uh, approvingly, apparently, is, who knows, John Brown, the abolitionist who sought to create a race war uh, to present the white people with the, of the South with a choice of either extermination in the style of Haiti or uh, liberating the black slaves. Uh, he does try to qualify this by, by sort of jocularly saying that that as the old abolitionist John Brown said, this is a country worth fighting for. Uh, and I know it could be justified that this is his effort to communicate with leftists and liberals uh, and bring them on board. But once again, it, it's the Isola Foster syndrome at work. Uh, I, as a Southerner, do not need to be motivated to fight for my country uh, by having the words of, of a psychopathic murderer, a person who <laughs> murdered
My great-grandparents were among the people that Brown wanted exterminated, and Brown committed murder with his own hands. Uh, I mean, he actually killed children in Kansas with his own hands. Uh, why quote someone like that? Why, why validate someone like John Brown, somebody who is an icon to everything that we hate in America and everything that we want to remove from our country in the future? I, I think reading his book, he, he harkens back nostalgically to Nixon. Uh, once again, there is no self-realization in, in Buchanan, a man, as I say, who I want to like. Let's cast our minds back to the Nixon administration, which I do not remember with any fondness at all. Richard Nixon, the father of affirmative action, the man who's destroyed and blighted the financial prospects of American working men and women. There are at least hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions of blue collar Americans whose old age now consists of penury and misery because of the policy created and implemented by Richard Nixon with Pat Buchanan loyally toiling for him in the vineyards. What was Patrick Buchanan thinking when he continued to loyally support a man like, like Richard Nixon? Richard Nixon, the man that brought more busing suits against school districts in America than any president before or since. And Pat Buchanan never protested. He, he went on working for Richard Nixon. Children have died as a result of that busing experiment. I have cousins who were physically beaten time after time after time again because they were bussed into black schools where men like Pat Buchanan and Richard Nixon would not go without a bodyguard. Uh, and yet, Pat Buchanan disparages David Duke. I also have disparaged David Duke. I have said very caustic things about him. Uh, and certainly the things that Buchanan picks out that he got involved in these fringe organizations are things that one can cite. But at least when my cousins were being bussed in those school districts, David Duke was fighting that. He was opposing that. And I was too. Pat Buchanan was not. <laughs> as much as I like Pat Buchanan and have supported him, I must tell him that when it comes to the issues of morality, when, when Duke's morality is weighed against his and the scales of my morality, uh, he, Patrick Buchanan, comes up far more wanting than David Duke. I want to do in this with one question. Th this is the point. I, I don't mean to be discouraging, and I certainly have great respect for the three colonists, and, and they're, they're more charitable. I know that one of my great faults is that, that I'm very judgmental and very harsh. I, I get this from centuries of Calvinistic Huguenot and Scottish and Northern Irish ancestors. And I have to write hurt on myself because I'm often very, very hard on people. But, and I'm certainly don't want to be hard on the people in this room because I, I, I admire, we, we deserve to feel good about ourselves here. But I have a question I want to ask people. Who here gave money to Patrick Buchanan? And, I, and I'm one of them. I want you to raise your hands, be honest. All right. Now, who here has given an equal amount of money to American Renaissance? maybe a third as many. Who here has given as much money to Sam Francis as they have to Pat Buchanan? I, I can say that I've given money. <laughs> we, have, we have two people other than Mr. Francis, and three counting me, that have given more help to Sam Francis than Pat Buchanan. As to Pat Buchanan, like Jared, I, I, I'm trying to write her to my judgmentalist. I say, good luck, Godspeed, God bless you, in your efforts to go out and sell your book to the general masses of the American people. But for those in this room, and I know that I'm getting ready to be pilloried by Sam Francis, who was worried about having me on this panel, but Sam Francis, for all of his many faults, is far more <laughs> the appropriate object of your charity and support than Pat Buchanan. <laughs> Joe Sober. <laughs> Joe Sober. Joe Sobrin and Jared Taylor and American Renaissance and individuals and causes that truly and uncompromisingly fight for us, that's where our money belongs. Let him do what he can in the general populace, but those of us in this room, 
our first, the, the, the natural objects of our affection, which is a term the law system used about your children and your nearest relatives, the, the people who would normally be in your will are the natural objects of your affection. The natural objects of our affection are, are people like Sam Francis, Jared Taylor, American Renaissance, Joe Sobern, the scientists who come here and spoken to us and risk all the professional opprobrium that they've taken, these people are the natural objects of our affection, and they have first claim on our resources. Thank you. First of all, uh, many of you know that I'm a personal friend of Pat Buchanan and have been one for 10 or 12 years now. Um, I read the manuscript of Death of the West uh, when Pat gave it to me and asked for my advice on it, and I gave him a lengthy memo uh, criticizing it and making some suggestions. Uh, I'm pleased to say, as far as I can say, as far as I can see from reading the book, he took at least two of my suggestions. One was to quote Jared Taylor by name when he cited the um, uh, New Century Foundation study on the color of crime. He had um, cited uh, in the manuscript the Washington Times uh, press story on this, and uh, uh, that was adequate, but I told him, you know, Jared uh, wrote the study, and you really ought to quote Jared by name, and so he does on page 70. The other recommendation that he took, as far as I can tell, is that he had used the term Native American to refer to American Indians, and I told him, look, you and I, Pat, are Native Americans. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> call them American Indians, um, and I believe he took that. Such is my influence with uh, the next president of the United States. <laughs> Uh, there are two things I think people have to remember about this book. Um, the original title of this book was The Death of Whitey. The subtitle of the book now is How Dying Populations and Immigrant Invasions Imperil Our Country and Civilization. I don't remember exactly what the, subtitle, the original subtitle was but it was something to the effect of how dying populations and immigrant invasions imperil our race and civilization, our country, race and civilization, or our, uh, the word race was in there somewhere. This book is published by St. Martin's Press. Some of you, many of you will know, will remember that in 1996, St. Martin's Press tried to publish another book, a biography of Joseph Goebbels written by David Irving. The Anti-Defamation League and other Jewish groups launched an onslaught of attacks, usually covert attacks, on St. Martin's Press and on the book, threatening it uh, with ruin if it proceeded with publishing the book, even though it had already been accepted by the Military Book Club and the History Book Club as an alternate or a main feature. And St. Martin's Press, and I believe the, the editor uh, at St. Martin's that Irving was dealing with. Uh, Thomas Dine, who's the same editor that, that Buchanan dealt with, dropped the book. There was uh, a large story in the Washington Post about this uh, entitled, How the ADL Helped Kill a Book. Christopher Hitchens wrote a column about it in Vanity Fair. There's, uh, Abe Foxman, the head of the ADL, boasted of how the ADL had helped kill this book. When I heard that Pat's book had been accepted by St. Martin's Press, I more or less anticipated that there would be the same kind of onslaught about it. Because if there is one person whom organized jury hates more than David Irving in this country, it's Pat Buchanan. That is simply the truth of it. As it turned out, Pat told me recently St. Martin's Press was concerned about it, and Pat was concerned about it. And as a, partly as a precautionary measure, they insisted that he change the title of the book, drop the word race from the subtitle, and remove the word race as much as possible from the text of the book, which was done. So there is more racial awareness 
in the original book and in Pat Buchanan's mind than this published version would necessarily suggest. The second thing you have to remember, I think, and have to understand is that Pat Buchanan is a man who evolved from being a Goldwater conservative in the 1960s to being essentially a political and economic nationalist by the end of the 1980s and 1990s. <coughs> His nationalism is not a racial nationalism. I think that Pat, uh, in my conversations with him over the years, uh, has shown uh, very little explicitly racial con uh, consciousness. You will remember, uh, to some extent, uh, you'll remember that in, um, I, I've forgotten if this came out uh, during the Watergate uh, period or later, but it was revived in 1992 or so. The New York Times published this, that uh, when Richard Herrenstein in 1971 published a uh, now somewhat famous article on the inheritability of IQ in the Atlantic Monthly, which uh, article turned out to be the embryo of the Bell Curve, published uh, over 20 years later. Uh, and, and Herrenstein, was a, a, this was an extremely controversial article at the time. Uh, Buchanan, who was a speechwriter to Nixon at the time in the White House, uh, sent him a memo recommending that he read Herrenstein's article and making the argument to him that uh, if this is true about the inheritability of IQ, and black IQ being lower for genetic reasons, then this pretty much invalidates all these affirmative action programs you've been, you've been promoting. That was in the memo that uh, was released by the New York Times. It also invalidates the busing programs the administration has been supporting. Now, I don't think, I think there are other arguments uh, in addition to that against those programs and I suppose that uh, Buchanan made them at the time, I don't know. Um, but, uh, and I, I think also there are more, more, much more, um, there are many more implications to um, uh, the IQ differences and the IQ argument than uh, simply invalidating affirmative action. Affirmative action could be uh, actually uh, uh, validated or argued for on other bases uh, regardless of, of the IQ issue. But that does show some racial awareness on Pat's part. But I don't think that it's fair to say that he is uh, a racialist, a racist, uh, or particularly racially conscious, uh, uh, however you define those terms. Um, there are the passages that Jared quoted, and uh, th those are accurate. Uh, so there is some racial awareness in Pat. but. Uh, I will um, point out uh, something that um, uh, he said during a recent book signing at uh, an Olson's bookstore in Washington uh, in January, soon after the book was published. Uh, some of you, I think, were there. Uh, the crowd at Olson's, it was a packed uh, uh, book signing, but the crowd tended to be leftist uh, to liberal, and he got a lot of hostile questions. And, Many of them had the sub-theme of uh, you're a racist, you're a neo-Nazi, that sort of thing. And um, at one point he said, um, and I, I want you to think about this sentence because I'm going to analyze it afterwards. You know, he said, uh, I grew up in Washington in the 1950s. It was a totally segregated society, and that was wrong. But back then, uh, blacks, uh, uh, did not cause problems. There was a very low crime